This episode of Shadowversity is brought to you by the Castles shirt! Because castles are awesome and you want to let your friends know that not only are they awesome, but you know that they are awesome as evident by this awesome shirt with an awesome castle on it. But not just any castle, I'm talking about a historically accurate, properly designed, high detailed castle with all the bells and whistles. Available through Teespring, link in the description. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and in this video I'm going to tell you how and why castles were invented. But to begin, you have to understand that fortifications existed uh, before castles and the medieval period. But why are these fortifications not considered castles? And what changed in the time of these earlier fortifications compared to the medieval period that caused the invention of castles? Really great questions, and we are going to get into them. It is widely understood in the historical community that the first design of castle that can be rightly called a castle, it is what is known as the Mott and Bailey. This castle is comprised out of two primary parts, and one of them is called the Mott. A Mott is a raised earthwork with a fortified structure atop of it that we would call a keep. The other half is the bailey. Now a bailey simply is an enclosed defensive courtyard and the name is carried on even through the evolutions of castles to refer to the inner courtyard of a fully walled off stone castle of a later period. That is called a bailey. Uh, another name for it is also a ward. What's really interesting when we look at the Mott and Bailey Castle is that the two halves are catering specifically to the main functions in which a castle was meant to fulfill, and that is as someone's residence but also a military fortress. Those two things were quite exclusive before the medieval period, and it was thanks to the unique conditions of the medieval period giving rise to the need of unifying those two separate things. And I'll speak more specifically on what those conditions are a bit later on in the video. What I want to touch on now are the two different types of fortifications that were joined together to give rise to the first type of castle, the Mott and Bailey. Because if you were to separate the two halves of a Mott and Bailey castle, you would essentially have two types of fortifications that did exist before. And you can actually clearly identify them. Separate the Bailey from a Mott and Bailey, you would have what is called a ring fort, something that again existed well before the medieval period. Now a ring fort is usually always a fortified farmstead, okay? If you're getting anything bigger than an individual farmstead, you're getting into what would you, you would generally call a hill fort, okay? So these are fortifications before the medieval period, before castles. A hill fort is generally a fortified community, while a ring fort is generally a fortified farmstead. And fortified can probably imply too grand a scale, because when we say uh, fortified in this sense, we really are considering uh, basically it has a basic wall around its perimeter, both for a hill fort and a ring fort. Now it can get more elaborate on top of this and the wall can be either just a, a raised earth portion surrounding it or and usually it can have a ditch in front of it and then it can also have a wooden railing on top of the ditch which is called a palisade. Now in contrast to this, if you were to separate the Mott from a Mott and Bailey castle, you would essentially have a watchtower of some kind or just a very, very very small military fort. It's important to note that both a ring fort and a military fort would not qualify as legitimate castles. The reason being that each type of structure is primarily built to cater to only one half of the functions that a castle was to fulfill. One being to fortify and protect someone's home, but not necessarily function as a military base or fort, nor having the more extensive fortifications that better enable the people who live within in that fort to repel attackers. So that's what a ring fort is lacking in regards to being compared to a real castle. And in addition to that, no building within a ring fort need to have any fortifications on it to be used to defend the overall structure. Whereas in contrast to this, a military fort will at least have one watchtower, if not multiple towers, all around its walls. But a military fort is rarely someone's primary residence nor centres of local government. By identifying the two types of fortifications that were combined to give us the first castles, 
This also, of course, informs us as to why the first type of castle, the Morton Bailey Castle, was designed the way it was. I could actually speak a lot more to the design of Morton Bailey Castles in regards to the ditches, the palisades, the separation of the Mott and Keep to the Bailey, but I'm actually going to make a separate dedicated video on this subject, because as history tells us, this design was superseded. There is actually some significant problems that were fixed with later evolutions in castle design. So please do keep an eye out for that video, but for now let's move on to the next portion of the invention of the castle, which is the question of what caused the combination of these two different yet earlier period types of fortifications into what we would classically understand as a castle. We can never definitively know the answer to that question, but I think we can speculate with a, a certain level of accuracy based on some of the things we know of this time. Uh, and I think one of the uh, more important elements uh, that caused this was the unique style or uh, structure of the government that uh, had to be made during this time period. You have to understand that this is after the fall of not only Rome, but in terms of the massive great large empires, state power became far less centralized. You had Charlemagne who was able to unify most of Europe, which was basically the only time after the fall of Rome where a very significant kind of area, geographical area, fell under one actual ruler, talking about Europe specifically, and he claimed himself to be the next Roman Empire. But it didn't take long for that empire to be fractured into, uh, well, to begin with just three major distinct areas. But even with this uh, initial fracturing, you have to understand there doesn't seem to have been uh, nearly enough state authority to rule and govern not only the landmass, but the population that was underneath them. So the answer was empowering local communities to be more autonomous in a sense, or at least empowering the leaders of these local areas to not only have more power, but have far more responsibility in protecting that area. In the time of Rome, you had a massive state military where every single uh, citizen was required, well male citizen, was required to serve in the military. And there was this big massive military machine but after the fall of Rome and when we're getting into the medieval, medieval period, no, not at all. The kings did not have the resources to be able to field such a large army, so it fell onto the local communities, uh, the leaders of the local communities, to fulfill the military needs of a community. So this is in law enforcement, but also protection. And as soon as you have more localized military units, well, they need a base. Essentially, they need a place to train, but also a place to retreat to for safety, that they can also resupply apply and uh and launch any type of military action. Uh, the next part that would have helped cause this was the increased danger of the time. And this is really interesting. You see, it would, in the time of Rome per se, it would be very rare for uh, uh, an attack to happen right in the heart of Roman territory, past all the border patrols where all the armies are stationed like that, uh, except for like in the latter period where Rome was actually sa uh, sacked. But if you look at Rome in its height and in its power, the people who are living well within the Roman borders could be quite confident that they were safe. But take away that large military force, okay, state-run military force where a large geographical area was being protected, now suddenly there's no centralized safe area. Every area is vulnerable to attacks from bandits, to attacks from rivals, because there was nowhere near as much unity under one ruler or state authority. Indeed, you could have two lords who had sworn loyalty to their king and still go to war with one another, and the king would have little power to stop them because he had far less military power and authority over his whole domain than what we have seen in past empires. And so for the sheer fact that you have to actually protect yourself against other people of your own kingdom and people and then with the added rise of yes the vikings an increased frequency of raiders from these uh, you know scandinavian lands makes the general landscape and climate of this early medieval period very dangerous far more dangerous than uh, other times so you need local military protection of some kind a means to protect them and enhance their effectiveness if you can't 
train or equip more soldiers, you simply need to do more heavy lifting with the soldiers you have. And the way to do this is by employing effective fortifications. Indeed, for all the roles that the local military and local lord needed to fulfill, proper protective fortifications, you can really see how essential they would be. But because these soldiers were going to be trained and equipped by a local governing official, it simply made sense to keep his soldiers near him to protect him, but also that he could train them and command them more directly. And to increase the effect of these soldiers, give them fortifications, logic just says, I'll make it my home, or I'll fortify my home, or I'll live in this fortification, all of the above. The thing is though, the local communal kind of fortifications, like ring forts and hill forts, they're not really up to scratch in the type of force multiplication you will want to give your own soldiers. Just having a wall around your farmstead or community doesn't do the job. You still need to protect your resources and your home, especially if you're the Lord, but at the same time, an enable your soldiers to repel attackers. And most ring and hill forts at that time were clearly lacking. But if, uh, you know, these people were to have taken inspiration from any source, I think they would have taken inspiration from the fortifications of Rome, especially because we see crenellations being employed in castle defences. Even as early as Motten Bailey castles, made out of wood, they also had crenellations. Hmm, I wonder who they learned that from. And they clearly learnt some other things as well. They already kind of understood the advantages of elevation in regards to digging ditches and stuff like that, but the profound advantage of higher elevations and defensive towers. So the simple conclusion is, Add a tower, and why not raise the tower up as high as possible? We'll dig a ditch and make a mot, and put the tower on that. And by adding a mot and tower to a ring fort or bailey, guess what we have? We have the mot and bailey castle. It was the unification of a defensive and offensive military structure with a residential structure, which arose out of the specific conditions and needs of their society in this time. And this is really interesting because we can see that some of the mots which would have keeps above them are nowhere near big enough to have anything but a, a tower atop them. They would have been too small and inadequate to function as a residence, but by it being on such a prominent position and looking imposing because of its fortified nature, it has a level of prestige and impressiveness about it that would simply appeal to really anyone. It's like, gee, I wouldn't mind living there. And again, we can see the logic in the evolution that this fortified, you know, military structure quickly became the primary residence of the Lord who built it. And in terms of the time frame that I'm kind of speaking here, the actual genesis of the castle, we're actually looking at mainland Europe around France at about the 10th century, as we can kind of uh, identify that these Mott and Bailey castles are actually being built in France before they ever came to, say, Britain and other parts of Europe, because we know that uh, there was a very large Mott and Bailey castle building enterprise that was launched by William the Conqueror after he conquered Britain. Because castles, not only are they really effective at protecting local resources and also uh, enabling uh, the local authority to field and and, uh, you know, run small military units and protect the local area really well, they are also quite effective at controlling a local area on top of that. Especially if the commoners under your authority are rebellious, well, uh, a castle is a type of force multiplier for a military unit. And a small military unit is actually capable of suppressing and controlling a much larger populace in respect to the military unit size. But one of the key things to be successful in this is to not let the populace build their own fortifications. And I think this gives clear insight as to why individual farmstead ring forts possessed by the local commoner kind of disappeared after castles arrived. Ring forts for individual farmsteads also became far less needed because these commoners could rely on their lords and his castle to protect them. Far less of a need to secure your farm with a ring fort when the area you, you live in is far more safer and secure 
secure thanks to the presence of a castle and a local well-equipped military force. Now if you want more detail onto the actual function of how castles are able to achieve this force multiplying effect, I've made a whole video called Why Were Castles Built? And that video is specifically to address what use castles gave in the medieval period in terms of military action. And there we go. This is how the castle was invented. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed or learnt something, and I hope to see you again. Until that time, farewell.